is a pretty decent small amount. And the first thing we're going to talk about is what, what is a really good fly to use uh, when you're chasing smallmouth? You know, with smallmouth, it depends on the scenario. Uh, most of the time, I tend to believe in efficiency more than going with, um, more than going with imitating something. So okay. you want to make sure that you are trying to cover the right type of habitat when you work. So your fly is really a tool for your presentation. It's not necessarily I need to imitate this specific thing. There's scenarios when that happens. Uh, I break down smallmouth flies in just a couple of different classes. So I have my deep subsurface flies. Um, that's where you're going to get your classics, your crayfish patterns, you're going to get um, your clouds or minnows, things that get used all the time. Mm -hmm. I actually don't use those as much as a lot of other people unless I'm in specific scenarios, typically wade fishing scenarios. I'll pull those flies out more. Um, most of the time I fish unweighted streamer patterns. So you've seen me tie a bunch of very, very simple bucktail flies. They cast very easily. They cover a lot of ground without a lot of effort. Right. And really the focus there is to make my presentation over as much of the correct habitat as possible, trying to look for those aggressive fish. So when you're in normal summer scenarios um, where you're looking to cover a lot of ground for your feeding fish, fall scenarios when they're selective on bait fish, and then even again in cool spring weather, uh, big streamers elicit a lot of strikes from larger fish because you can call them in from longer distance. What about collar? Collar, I'm a little weird on collar. Um, I tend to fish white. 90% of the time because I can see it well. So the movement in your presentation, uh, how the smallmouth reacts to what you're doing with the fly at that time, that has a lot to do with my fly choice and the color just allows me to see that easier. There are time frames where I might get something more specific. I might use brighter colors if I have stained water. I may occasionally go to black if it stands out really well, has high contrast with the background. Um, but most of the time I'm fishing white just because I can see it well. Okay. Um, All right. Length? What would that good length be? It's going to vary. I fish basically the same patterns in, call it small, medium, large. So in a lot of small stream scenarios, uh, really clear water scenarios, I'll fish anything from one and a half, two inches on up to seven or eight inches for some of those bigger smallmouth presentations. A lot of times I'll have some two inch long patterns, some four or five inch patterns, which is what I fish the majority of times, probably about four, four and a half inches okay. uh, for those streamers. And then occasionally, typically in the fall or early spring, um, I'll fish some six and seven and occasionally eight inch patterns for big smallmouth. Or in scenarios where I'm kind of doing a mixed bag, where I'm looking a little bit for, I don't know if a smallmouth or a muskie or a striper is going to eat this. I don't care. I'm going to have a fun time with whatever three eats it. Okay, what about uh, streamers versus poppers? Particular fly for particular times, right? Yeah, so I use streamers a lot because they fish very efficiently. Okay. But there are times when poppers are really a great go-to. In fact, when I was guiding for smallmouth, a lot of my biggest fish uh, for clients came on poppers. Okay. Uh, I think the biggest one I ever had a client catch was on a popper. Now, part of the reason poppers are great is if you have fish that are in an isolated area, I actually use poppers a lot wade fishing as opposed to float fishing. I can call fish in from a long distance, but I can fish them slowly or quickly. So I kind of have two different presentations I fish with poppers. Uh, a lot of times I'll fish poppers very slow, I'll dead stick poppers, make some noise and leave them there for 5, 10, 15 seconds. Really allow that fish to find it, come up and take it. Um, and then I'll fish sometimes, especially in dirty water, something that works really well on big smallmouth is to fish a large popper, like the one I showed you earlier. Mm -hmm. Four or five inch, very loud. This guy, very loud, uh, obnoxious popper that makes a ton of noise. And in those circumstances, I'll actually fish them on a really constant retrieve, making a bunch of noise. It was uh, in experimenting trying to fish poppers for muskies that we figured that out, that in dingy water, the smallmouth really liked those big poppers, so we kept having big smallmouth eat them, so we just downsized a bit and did really well with those. Most of the time when I fish poppers, though, I'm fishing something um, a lot slower, so something like a bull bug or a blockhead popper. And then in clear water, I'll go to a, like a darter style, like a sneaky peat or a boogle bullet. Um, any some something really quiet like that, and that's a really good sight fishing fly, especially in shallow water. Here we get a lot of those smallmouth on those really shallow flats. Yeah. If you spot them, it's a good way to get a fly eight, ten feet in front of a fish, barely make any noise, and it's remarkable how many big smallmouth respond to that really well. In fact, I do better doing that 
um, in shallow water than with crayfish, which is kind of the common, if you're sight fishing, use a crayfish pattern, use something like that so you can, um, you know, get to the bottom, try to pick that fish up like you're sight fishing for redfish. But in fact, a lot of times, I find because the popper makes a little less clunk on the surface, um, they're more apt to respond well to that than to respond to something dragging on the bottom, though it can go either way. But yeah, really, outside of it's streamers, poppers, and occasionally crayfish patterns, see the majority of what I'm fishing. It's a pretty simple setup. What's your favorite? My favorites are pretty simple. It's a dumbed down uh, deceiver minnow or uh, the Popovix style deceivers, which are very you know, simple cones of bucktail, very easy right. to cast. If you're going to make a lot of casts, having something that doesn't weigh anything but has a fair bit of size is really what I like to go with. With little material? Not very much material, simple pattern, um, great minnow shape, but because of the conical shape of that fly, it's not a flat profile like a classic deceiver. Mm -hmm. It's more of a cone shape, so it actually pushes a little bit more water and has a tendency to dart quite a bit. Give it, give it, it gives the fly a lot of natural movement. Um, and it allows the fly to sink very slowly, so large smallmouth have a tendency, last fall, that big one you hooked while you are fishing, hits on a complete dead stick. You had to remind me of that, didn't you? <laughs> I, I did have to remind you of that. It was a, that, um, that was a nice fish. That was a big fish. So you're going to have those fish, and a lot of times those bigger fish respond like that one did. You know, it comes up, stares at the fly, you give the fly a little twitch, the fly hasn't sunk out of the zone. So that's part of why I go with the unweighted flies versus going with uh, some classic like a Clouser minnow. Okay. Clouser is a great pattern, but when you have those big small mouth in the clear water that are coming up and looking at flies, the ability for the fly to stay there and barely move, it just breathes in the water, um, really is a great trigger for those big small mouth. It doesn't take a lot of movement. In fact, if you move too fast, they'll follow it and they won't eat it. The ability to have that big fish come up after you make a lot of movement with the fly, you strip the fly real fast, you give the fly a pause, the fish shows up to stare at it. One little twitch and the fly sits there and breathes for a second, it doesn't move and they just gently suck it in completely, completely duped, which is one of my favorite things to watch a four or five pound smallmouth do that. Kind of like the one that, I'm, <laughs> that I hooked into yes, and that one. got away. Yeah. All right, well that's, uh, that's it on the flies. Uh, we'll, we'll get into another part, another segment of this uh, series of interviews. What type of cover should we be looking for in stretches of the creek and moving water, uh, you know, as opposed to standing water? What what uh, what is the best thing to be looking for on small creeks and rivers? You know, it's going to vary um, depending on time of year. So these smallmouth do migrate in and out of areas. Basic rules are smallmouth like hard bottom. They are they're a fish that lives on rock, lives on hard bottom. Okay. There's certain types of streams where they get away from that a little bit, but um, you know, Ohio, it's it's actually pretty cut and dry. When you get down into the unglaciated portions of Ohio, um, you know, the glaciers pushed a ton of rock and gravel. So when you're in the glaciated portions, everything is rock, everything is gravel. The fish will sit on what they like the most. Um, they'll find specific areas that has the right bottom composition. You get down to the areas, uh, particularly southeastern Ohio, um, where it's unglaciated, you actually start to run into more spotted bass than smallmouth because the habitat's really more that sandy bottom, wood cover, there are good rivers that are wood and sandy, but for the most part, um, smallmouth are creatures of rock bottom. That being said, you know, not all rock bottoms created equal. So really what you're looking for is um, a combination of multiple types of hard bottom. So you can have sand, which barely constitutes a hard bottom, moving into gravel, cobbles, which is, you know, kind of a classic. You're looking at, say, a golf ball to softball size rock, anything anything bigger than a basketball I would consider boulders. Okay. Um, and then you have bedrock, which we have a lot of rivers in this particular area that are a lot of bedrock. What I've found is, you know, there's some rivers I've fished in different parts of the country where the fish hold on bedrock a little more, some where they hold in boulders more, um, but smallmouth have a tendency not to be so much like trout, where they sit behind a boulder. The boulder itself is not why they're there. Um, they're typically, you're looking for a combination. They really like cobble. Cobble has the most food, it's got a lot of areas, but what you want is cobbles with something else on them. So the boulder is a plus one in most of the scenarios I fish. Um, if there's a boulder on a piece of bedrock, it might have a fish. If there is a boulder on sand, it likely won't have a fish. 
if you have a cobble flat with four or five boulders in an area, you might have 20 fish in that particular area because it's got something for them to relate to on the bottom composition that has the large quantities of their food. Okay. So once you get your hard bottom, um, which in some rivers is 10% of the habitat, some rivers it's 95% of the habitat. Once you identify the right kind of hard bottom, then you start to look at where is it located within the pool structure. So generally, you know, you're looking at the classic ripple pool and then the tail out of the pool. Um, the ripples themselves are what most people tend to focus on. So classically for small mountain, you know, we take a crayfish pattern, we go into a riffle and we look for a boulder and riffle and throw behind the boulder. And I think a lot of that stems from the fact that we started as trout fishermen and fly fishing and moved to smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, moved to a lot of other species, so we took a lot of those trout habits with us. And there are certain rivers in the country that I've found where that works very well, but most of the ones I've fished, um, your riffle habitat, in the summer at least, tends not to be where those big smallmouth live. So if you're looking to catch a whole bunch of four to nine inch long smallmouth, which is a lot of the smallmouth in a lot of the rivers, right. they tend to spend a lot more time in that riffle habitat. Um, your large fish tend to spend most of the time in the pool habitat. So pools are where it gets really interesting because, you know, you look at some of these big pools that we catch a lot of fish out of, you would identify as catfish water right off the bat. But then you break down the pool into what is the bottom composition within the pool, does it have current, that kind of thing. Um, once you find hard bottom in a long pool, and most of these rivers aren't nearly as deep as people think they are. They go, right. oh, there's a 15-foot deep hole over there, you get a boat over it, it's six right. in the deep spot. Most of it's a big three or four foot deep flat. So the smallmouth will cruise those areas um, and sit in these long pools. You know, there's a ton of bait fish in those pools, just absolute just loads of shiners. Some of the rivers around here get uh, seasonal migrations, the gizzard shad coming up out of the larger systems. And those big fish will often cruise those pool habitats. They don't have to work hard. Um, they kind of own the territory and they cruise hunting those shiners. So they identify those areas within the pools with a cruise and then um, you will get fish related to wood, particularly in late summer and fall. I see more fish relating to wood. That is often still over a hard bottom, um, but as they transition to cooler, uh, cooler water holding areas, they start to look for those deeper pools and they'll associate with wood more. doesn't mean they won't associate with wood the rest of the year. It's just generally not as critical as having that rock bottom. Okay. All right. Well, um, if uh, we can uh, get into uh, a couple other things here soon, but I think that pretty well covers uh, the, the topic of this, uh, this video. We'll very, very much on the river size. So, okay. you know, there are time frames where we use rafts to get down certain rivers. There's time frames where we're looking at uh, fishing out of jet boats in some of the larger rivers, mm -hmm. or even out of prop boats. Um, but then most of the rivers, you know, we're talking about, classically most people will have uh, the ability to fish smaller rivers that are either weighted or canoed. Um, or maybe you can kayak fish. So a lot of the rivers around here, they're very shallow in the summertime. You can have riffles that you have to drag through. So right. it gets really, really tough to take larger boats down. Um, right. I've taken jet boats up rivers that you really shouldn't. <laughs> I've wrecked jet boats up rivers that you really shouldn't be on. Yeah. So. Um, and you're going to put some fish down doing that unless you give them some time to rest. But as far as stealth, you know, I'm not convinced that smallmouth are so spooky that you can't um, be a little bit loud. That being said, it makes it harder on you to make the presentation. If you are making a lot of noise, you might have to be making 80 foot casts to move at any amount of speed without spooking those fish. Um, if you're moving very slowly and very quietly, you can make short casts. Wouldn't that... I mean, there's some people that say, well, I've been very noisy. In fact, I've caught a pretty nice smallmouth with some guys using a uh, motorcycle or a uh, dirt bike. Mm -hmm. They were they were hitting their dirt bike in, this, in the stream that I was fishing, and you would think it was scared everything away, and I caught a smallmouth. But it wasn't a very big smallmouth. So would there be a possibility that, um, that the smaller the fish, the less, you know, scared they are of the noise? There's no hard fixed rule. Okay. Um, we are talking general, you know, just making generalizations here. Right. Uh, smallmouth are an inherently incredibly curious fish. Okay. So a limited amount of noise, you know, you're fishing poppers, you're fishing really loud. They come and investigate because they're curious. I have actually been walking up small streams and had big smallmouth come onto a flat and cruise towards me as I was walking noisily, and then I stopped, and they kept cruising towards me until they got close enough. They realized that I was 
you know, very tall and <laughs> not a stick and not something splashing. Right. Um, and I've actually had a couple of them come up, and, and I've almost certain they were investigating me. I've actually had some things I've read where guys that dove and did observations would say smallmouth will follow you around when you're snorkeling. Yeah, yeah actually, I'm a certified scuba diver, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know about the smallmouth, but I can remember when I would dive a lake or something, the fish that if you were up, up above the water and you reached down at them, they'd scat. Once but you're down there, they don't seem to care they, much. Yeah, they seem to think that you're one of them or something. Mm -hmm. um, so smallmouth are really curious. So you'll run into some scenarios, particularly in really low, clear summer streams, where some noise will really put them off. Um, making noise isn't going to completely stop the fish from feeding, but you do have a limit. Um, so it becomes an efficiency game. It's really what it is. If you are moving slow, you can get close to the fish, um, you can make a little bit of noise, but if you slow down and go quiet, you can get much closer if you can't make those really long casts. Right. A lot of scenarios, the balance is, I want to be able to cover ground looking for those dominant, large, aggressive fish, and I want to do that in the most efficient way possible. So a longer cast allows me to move a little bit faster, make a little bit more noise, and still do that. Um, so I generally am a little bit noisier. Now, to make up for that, I've gone to fishing out of canoes most of the time. So like the way we fished last year, right. you fish in a canoe, you have uh, one angler paddle, and then the other angler in the front of the canoe fish. And I stand up and fish in a canoe. Sorry. No, that's all right. I stand up and fish in a canoe. Um, I don't recommend that for everybody. You want to be comfortable with what you're doing. There's times when there are some really cool small rafts on the market now. I know when my, some of my friends are uh, getting Smith fly rafts, these little two-man rafts that don't weigh a whole lot. We might be able to get down these rivers. But your issue does become how efficiently can you get it over log jams and the one float we did last year where I don't know how many times we had to get out of the boat and pick it up and carry it around trees and that sort of thing. So the canoe tends to be my go-to. It's very quiet. These fish don't, there's not a lot of splashing, there's no motor noise. You're not walking around the boat. Uh, it's a plastic canoe. It's, as long as you don't bang against it, it's not making a lot of noise. You can get remarkably close to fish. But. And then what about, one of the things that I've done is when I'm moving downstream in the water and I see a hole that I think is going to hold fish, I might hold there for a minute or two before I actually make my cast. You, you, do you think that's a good idea or am I wasting time? Um, I don't tend to bother, but it's going to depend on the scenario you're in. If I see one of those coming up, I might make my cast there, but I might make a much longer cast than normal. If you can. If I can pull it off. There's right. some places you've just got to creep into really slow in order to make the cast. If you've got a hard bend, you can't make an 80-foot cast, you know, some obscene not going to happen cast into there. Uh, sometimes you've got to really creep into an area. You've got to go around a tree to drop in there. In those circumstances, I'll slow down a whole lot so I don't put those fish off. If it's an open area and I can make that long cast, I might simply slide a little bit towards one bank, give it a wide berth, make a bomb cast in there, and keep moving. I don't want to slow down too much because if you slow down too much, you're not covering enough ground to be efficient to find those dominant fish. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you saw the speed I like to fish. It's, mm -hmm. it's not as effective per river mile as slowing down. But if I'm covering, you know, I might catch 20 fish wading a stretch, a one mile stretch. I might only catch five floating in. But if I can cover as much, if I cover eight or ten miles a day boat fishing, and I can only cover one, one and a half miles a day wade fishing, I have now caught a lot more fish, um, just by the simple fact that I'm covering so much more ground. You know, I'm not catching the smart ones. I'm, I'm not particularly good at catching smart fish. I'm just really good at finding stupid ones. All right. Well, that's it uh, on that particular topic, and um, we'll come back with one more, and we'll close this thing up. Hey, this is Mike and Lou again. We're going to close up this uh, series of smallmouth, chasing smallmouth. And uh, I, what we're going to get into now is uh, rod, rod and line weight, um, mm -hmm. sinking lines and floating lines. And, and again, we're talking mostly about uh, stream and creek and river fishing here, not so much lakes. But um, I do use a sinking line occasionally. But what, what, is, the, what is a good, not best, but all-round rod for chasing creek and river smallmouth? 90% of the time I tend to go with a six-weight rod. Um, I'm a little fanatical about six weights I get laughed at because, you know, when in doubt I have a six weight for everything. You can pull off a lot. Uh, the reason I really prefer the six weight rod is because the grain weight of the line 
um, and the power of the rod. It has the widest range of fly sizes I can throw with a single rod. It has nothing to do with fighting a fish to a degree. You know, it's light enough that a small fish is pretty fun still. I think smallmouth are entertaining at any size. Right. Um, it's heavy enough that you don't often run the risk of, I can't get this large fly into that area. You know, sometimes you're wading a small stream and I've showed up with a four weight and then I see, you know, some shad have moved up river and there's a pot of large smallmouth focused in on some six inch long shad. I'm kind of SOL when that happens. Right. Um, I like to have my six weight as a just in case. Granted, if it's not a scenario, if you're not typically going to run into larger uh, fly presentations, lighter rods are fine. I rarely go down to, a, down to anything like a four weight, but I will go down to a four weight for smallmouth and small stream presentations. I don't typically like to go lighter simply because of the casting. It has nothing to do with the, you know, not being able to land the fish. The flies that you're throwing at are fairly small. You should be able to get the hook sunk with those smaller flies. It really just comes down to trying to get any distance, um, any variation in your presentation with a, with a smaller rod becomes more difficult. Now we use up to an eight. I've even got some buddies that throw nine weights when we're throwing. For small mouth? For, when we're throwing, the one place I took you where there's some very, very large small mouth. They like large flies. You know, we might be throwing six or seven or eight inch flies. I rarely go that heavy. Oftentimes I'll stick with a seven weight. Um, normally if I pick up an eight weight, it's for large poppers. But I have friends that'll throw nines Partially because, you know, we're also throwing wire in a lot of those situations. So right. if you're in an area where you might catch 6 or 8 or 10, 15 to 20 inch smallmouth and a 35 inch muskie, the 9 weight's not completely out of the ballpark. Right. Um, I think that's a little excessive, but if you're comfortable with it, what you have. If your options are a 6 weight and a 9 weight, you don't have a 7 or an 8 weight, and you are in a scenario where you need to throw that larger fly, that's really when I would pull that out. There's only, there's only one stream that I really ever think I'd target smallmouth with a nine weight. Um, and half of that has to do with most of the biggest smallmouth I've ever seen in my life have been there and the other half has to do with how many muskies. Is that the one we hit at the end of last year? Uh, that's the one that I fish all the time that I took you to. Down, down Southern Ohio? Yeah. Okay. Um, and there's, you, you know, it's a really rare scenario. It's big water, you have to fish very large flies to call the fish out of it, cover any ground, it's a low density stream. So really it comes down to casting. Um, 90% 90, 90 of the time, though, I'm, I'm all about the six weight. It throws anything, and I've thrown tiny dry flies with a six weight and light tippet for trout just because I had a six weight and I wanted to do it. It's light enough that while it's not perfect, I can get the job done with a six weight. I've thrown down to a size 22 um, midge with 6x tippet for trout on a six weight, and on the same day, in the lower end of that float, they started generating water on that trout tail water, the striper down there, and I turned around and stuck a five inch clouser and 20 pound tip and a sink tip on the same six weight and was able to throw it. And that's really what I'm looking at. If I have one rod, I want as much diversity as I can. That one rod does more than anything else. Um, and for most smallmouth presentations, it's perfect. It's light enough that it's not going to wear you out casting all day. It's heavy enough that you can get some of those bigger presentations out if you need to. Uh, and it'll land, it'll effectively land any size of smallmouth you run into. Um, I guess within reason. There's always that outlier. We might hook a big enough small mouth, we've hooked some big enough small mouth, have enough cover where six weights start to push it. It's an incredibly rare scenario, and I'm willing to kind of take that risk. But uh, it's really about making an effective presentation that's easy on you, easy on your shoulder, easy on your elbow. Uh, if you start to fatigue, you start to throw poorly. And technique is really what it is. You shouldn't be using all those joints I just mentioned for everything. You shouldn't be stressing your arm out, but if you fish a heavy rod, you start to fatigue, bad things start to happen. You start to throw with bad technique and that's when you can start to really wear yourself out. Um, but no, that's the rod I use. Now when it comes to lines, I, uh, again, being a six weight fanatic, I've definitely shown up with three different six weights. One with a floating line, one with a sinking line, one with an intermediate tip, just to cover my basis. I might be using the same way to rod, but I use many, many different lines based on what I'm doing. Most of those lines don't have that much to do with depth. They have a lot more to do with the speed of the retrieve that I want. So ironically, when I'm fishing the deepest of the year is typically early spring, you know, pre-spawn, those fish are in some deep, faster areas, and uh, oftentimes in that scenario, I'm not fishing full sinking lines, because the full sinking line will get drugged by the current. Right. I'm fishing sink tips, or even on occasion, floating lines, somewhere I can control my fly line with a heavy fly to try to pull that presentation in that eddy. And then uh, most of the year, 
you know, intermediate tips or floating lines, I throw those a lot. I still throw a floating line the majority of the time anymore, but there's a lot of times where an intermediate tip or a light sink tip allows me to take my unweighted fly and get it a couple feet down. You don't want to be too deep. You want to keep good, um, you want to be able to see your fly most of the time in the summer. Sometimes in the spring, it's about the only time we ever fish where I can't physically see my fly. But uh, when you're in those scenarios, having something where I can get some speed, the joke is when we throw full sinking lines, it's usually because I'm trying to fish the fly really fast. So I'm not trying to get it down. I'm throwing a full sinking line so I can strip the fly as fast as I want and it's still a foot or two down, as opposed to if I strip the fly that fast with a floating line, it's just dragging across the surface. Right. So oftentimes it's really more about speed and sinking lines do turn over large flies better. So when we're fishing bigger flies, anything north of five inches, I'm almost exclusively throwing a sink tip or a sinking line or an intermediate tip, something that transfers energy uh, a lot better at the end. And then something I can get away with a much shorter leader. One of the big things with those presentations is I'm fishing typically two to four foot leaders on them. So you get better turnover into cover. So if you're trying to punch a five or six inch streamer, behind trees or right next to the bank. It's just much easier with a sinking line or an intermediate tip line. Okay. All right, well, um, we'll go ahead and, and close this up here, but to kind of close things out, the most important thing that people need to, to consider when they want to do their smallmouth fishing, whether, they, whether they've been doing it for a while or they're just getting started, mm -hmm. I think is just don't be afraid to experiment. Just get out there and, and just fish. No. And then learn as you're doing it. Smallmouth are fantastic because they because they're so curious, right. because they can be so aggressive, they are the fish that if you want to experiment, you can't. I would almost say that there's no wrong answer to catching a smallmouth. Right. There are some much less effective answers. Right. But man, I've had to meet some weird stuff. I caught a smallmouth on a 17-inch fly fishing for muskies. Um, I've caught smallmouth on zebra midges drifting for trout. I know, that's crazy. It, they, they will eat just about anything, yeah. at, given the right times. Um, Your odds go up, though, when you do get into the right equipment, the right flies. That's and... the big thing. And if you, if, if you have equipment that's not quite right, you know, the good thing about smallmouth is most people have a four, five, six, seven weight. Right. I prefer the six. A five does just fine as long as you're not throwing heavier presentations. Um, most people have a couple of the right flies. I'm going to get... I'm going to get all sorts of crud because I never mentioned woolly buggers and the flies. Woolly buggers are good. You know, I never fish them. You don't? No. Why not? Uh, woolly buggers are a good fly in most yeah. scenarios and yeah. typically never the best fly in a given scenario. Really? The only presentation I think woolly buggers beat everything else on is helber mites. They're the best. A black number four woolly bugger is the best helber mite imitation I know. Okay. Um, and I very rarely fish that situation. So I might catch a half dozen small ones a year on a woolly bugger because I never tie them on. <laughs> They're probably always the fifth best fly in the box and in every given scenario. And my popper some days is the best fly in my box and other days is the 20th best fly in my box. But because which, which, would buggers, you, which would you prefer catching? The, I know what I would rather catch them on. What, what, what fly would you rather catch your smallmouth on? I mean, you've seen me fish. I don't fish anything that's not within the first foot of the surface most of the time okay. if it's not on the surface. Right. Uh, but that's that's just, where the excitement comes in. Yeah, but even then, you know, everybody has woolly buggers. Everybody has something that'll work. It'll always catch fish. Right. So if you have two to four inch long flies that are easy to cast and a five weight, that's the beauty of smallmouth. You probably have them around if you're in the Midwest and some of the places out in the West. Um, you can find rivers that have smallmouth. You can go down. You can walk a stretch. You find some rocky areas. You throw a fly in there. You're gonna hook. You're gonna hook something most of the time. And if you make enough noise, that's the joke. They they want to find things. That they're, I once read uh, in a smallmouth book that small that smallmouth bass were the gentlemen of the warm water stream. Oh, really? Um, and it was written. I feel terrible. I can't remember who it was written by. It's on the Shenandoah. He's one of the best smallmouth anglers out there for years. I hate to disagree with him, but uh, that's a very trout outlook on smallmouth bass. But the smallmouth bass are like they're back alley thugs. They yeah. go and they murder things in little shaded corners of the stream, and all they do is walk around to see, look for things they can beat up all the time. That's why they're such a great sport fish. Right. Like they want to go and hunt things down. That's all they do all the time, especially in the summer. They really watch the things. They're just cruising around looking for things to kill. So yeah. that's why they're awesome. All right. Well, I'll tell you, I'm wanting to go fishing, like right now.
<laughs> it'd be great if it wasn't 34 degrees outside. I know, right? All right, well, anyway, this is Mike. I uh, hope you got something out of this series. Uh,